changed the tenor of the protests? Yes, I think it really has changed it dramatically, though the, the Orangemen uh, of Porta Down, uh, beneath the Rum Creek Church, just a few hundred yards away, wouldn't, wouldn't agree with that. Uh, but their own leaders have urged them, appealed, asked them, almost begged them to stop this uh, protest, uh, uh, though they, they remain determined to go on and to assert the right to walk down uh, a section of road through a Catholic area where they are not wanted. They are going to continue with those protests uh, despite what's happened? They're going to continue with the protests, but there's no sign this evening of the, the, the violent demonstrations, the riots uh, that we have seen most nights for the past week. Uh, right now, the Reverend Ian Paisley, I think, is, is talking to them. And uh, you, one gets the sense that um, we're not going to have any rioting tonight. In fact, the uh, security forces have drawn down considerably, though, of course, they could ratchet them up any time. Eamon Malley has been covering us for so many years. Mr. Malley, as you look at this, where do you see things standing now? Well, you know, there are a lot of uh, doom and gloom merchants around in Northern Ireland at this point in time, uh, and they're suggesting that this is the end of the peace process of the political system, etc. In fact, au contraire is what I would say. I think that what we have witnessed in the past week will add momentum, wit, to the political process here and the new system, the administration, the assembly which has been put in place in recent weeks will become stronger as a result of this. So I actually am more hopeful now as a result of what is happening. Well, here is the alternative point of view, uh, Mr. Malley. There are those who say, look, there are hardliners on both sides. We certainly see the hardliners on the Protestant st side here in Portadown. It does not take many of them to push over the edge to violence and to break down the peace process. Yes, I have lived through this, and uh, I've been reporting on this story for 22 years. What I'm seeing now, what I'm witnessing now is that more of the major forces within politics are now inside the tent in the assembly at Stormont than at any point in our life in Northern Ireland. And that's why I'm confident that this particular assembly which has been put in place has a chance, and people are now sheltering under the same umbrella. And Senator Mitchell, uh, who's a uh, guest in your program, will understand exactly what I'm saying at this point in time. Hillary, give me a street's eye view of this as well. Do you feel that there is something different about this now it is in the in the light of the peace process than the, those you have seen in years past? Well, just just uh, talking to people here on, on, on both sides of, of the cultural divide, both are, seem to, there seems to be an undercurrent of fear that, um, that, that, that the terrible murder of these three boys is going to uh, bring all the ancient hatreds seething up to the surface again and that, that uh, the problems could be once again dragged into a terrible cycle of violence. That's what the people on the street are saying. Whether it's true, well, one hopes it is not true. Well, one hopes it might actually be the impetus to peace. Hillary Brown and Eamon Malley, I thank you both for talking to us tonight. In a moment, the chairman of the Irish Peace Talks, former U.S. Senator George Mitchell. Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell chaired the negotiations on the future of Northern Ireland that resulted in the Good Friday Peace Agreement. He is with us tonight from St. Helena, California. Senator, I know you've been watching with great interest to the violence that has been fomented by Protestant hardliners since the March decree was issued. How concerned are you about the problems that have arisen? It's a matter of real concern, although everyone expected there would be difficulty. I, I think the latest horrible atrocity, the murder by arson of those three young boys, will hopefully bring to people in Northern Ireland the realization that they're right now at an abyss and they could topple into a renewed round of sectarian warfare, or they can go back on the path of peace and reconciliation, which the agreement said. I very much hope they'll choose the latter. Well, it does seem to have at least sobered them today, and they have, they have been a lot calmer than they have been in the past. Do you have reason to believe that it's going to continue that way? I think it will improve. Uh, for us, the people of Northern Ireland are better than this. I spent three and a half years there. They're good people. They're searching for a way out of their past, out of the terrible death and destruction, fear and anxiety that's so dominated their lives. And in the election, an overwhelming majority of people, North and South, voted for an agreement which includes exclusively peaceful means of resolving their disputes. Of course, there are always going to be criminal elements, terrorists, murderers. Uh, there are in every society, including ours, and you can't expect the complete absence of violence. But I hope very much that people will now be shocked into realizing
just what is at stake and that they will take calm steps and resume on the path of progress. Well, David Trimble is Northern Ireland's first minister. Just a few days ago, he said, unless this uh, standoff over the Protestant desire to march in the Catholic uh, area was, quote, resolved satisfactorily, it could put at risk all the political progress achieved. Now, if a march in a small town in Little County Armagh could put at risk everything, that doesn't say that the peace process is very stable, does it? Uh, well, I said at the time we announced the agreement and have said almost daily since that the agreement did not by itself ensure peace and political stability. It made them possible, but a lot of hard work was necessary. The march in this small town, however, assumes a huge amount of symbolism and invokes emotions all across Northern Ireland. And if this can be resolved, and I, I hope and believe that it will, and then I think another large obstacle will have been overcome in the search for a durable peace. But believe me, there are many more controversies ahead. This is but one of several problems that have to be resolved. Well, that seems to me to be the very point, because there are these great looming symbols like boulders in the road all along the way. And the peace process could look very nice on paper, but when they begin to see it as a reality and it confronts them, it is not too difficult for some hardliners to cause some tremendous problems. That is true. Of course, the alternative is to succumb to despair and sectarian warfare and lies filled with fear and death, and that's not acceptable to most people. So I think there is a grim realization there that they've got to continue on the path that was set by this agreement, and I believe ultimately there will be genuine reconciliation. It'll take a long time because it's easier to rebuild structures and create institutions than it is to change what's in people's minds and hearts. But the overwhelming majority of the people there are good people, and you cannot stain a whole society with the acts of a few cowardly murderers, such as those who committed this latest crime. Uh, help us look at this, this fight that's going on over the march through uh, American eyes. You remember years ago in Skokie, Illinois, when some Nazis were allowed to march in a largely Jewish neighborhood. It was decided that uh, by American standards, free speech allowed them to do that. Now, they were not allowed to march here in a Catholic neighborhood. Why not? Well, it has a very long history and tradition for us, which would take much more than the time allotted for this okay. show to explain. Senator, I but understand that, but the point, the point I'm asking is, why not allow them that free speech to march in that area? Because it's too volatile? Uh, it, it is very volatile. There's a long history on both sides, and there are legitimate claims being made by both sides. The point to be made is this. There are 3,000 marches each year in Northern Ireland. All but a handful go off peacefully because the local officials sit down with each other and work out an accommodation. What distinguishes this situation at Portadown has been the unwillingness of the local officials to meet until now. They've just started a meeting. They're going to resume, I hope, uh, if they haven't already today. And that's the key there, to do what they do all across Northern Ireland reach a local accommodation. I believe it can be done because it's done in 99% of the cases. Senator, let's take a pause here and when we come back I'd like to ask you about what you see as the future of the peace process in the days ahead. That just down the road. We are back with former Senator George Mitchell who chaired the very difficult peace agreement that was uh, finally reached just uh, three months ago. Senator, take a longer view for, uh, for me if you will. I know how, how delicate it was, how difficult it was. Do you remain as hopeful as you were on the day when that agreement was signed? Yes, I do. Uh, there will be a long, difficult period ahead, perhaps as many as two or three years. The marching season will come again next summer and the summer after. And in the summer and autumn of 99, two important commissions created by the agreement will complete their work and report, one on the criminal justice system and one on policing. Those will be very difficult problems to resolve. I think once those hurdles are overcome and once the new institutions begin to function, the assembly providing local government to Northern Ireland and north-south institutions working for the mutual benefit of people in the north and south of Ireland, I think once those begin to function, once people see that problems can be resolved through democratic and peaceful means, I believe the future remains very hopeful. You know, there's an old Belfast joke, I'm sure you've heard it. The question is, are you a Catholic uh, or a Protestant? And the answer is, I'm a Buddhist. And then the question is, are you a Catholic Buddhist or a Protestant Buddhist? Yeah, uh, yeah. How do you see this leading to those two sides, which have been at war for so very long, actually to begin to talk to one another? 
Well, of course, the agreement did represent that, and the overwhelming endorsement by the people made clear that the majority of the people, North and South, Protestant and Catholic, support the effort to bring about peace and political stability and reconciliation. The important thing is not to be driven off course by a relative handful of people on both sides who have always opposed the peace process and who are committed to violence as a way of getting what they think will be 100% of their way. That's not a prescription for a solution, that's a prescription for war and that's what most people in Northern Ireland don't want. And as you look at it today, in light of the fight that we have seen over the, over the marches, what do you see as the single biggest obstacle ahead? Oh, very clearly uh, dissolving the hate and replacing it with hope. Uh, as I said earlier, the hardest thing to change is what's in people's minds and hearts. Very difficult, and I think it really will be up to the younger generation. Uh, but I think it can be done because they all recognize that the alternative is unacceptable. The alternative is another quarter century of hate and fear, death and destruction. And they don't want to go back to that, and I don't believe they will. Former Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell, who chaired the peace negotiations in Northern Ireland, I thank you for talking with us tonight, sir. Thanks for having me, Forrest. And that is our report for tonight. Tomorrow, the first of two nightlines.